Isun Shin, or also known as the God of War, was a Korean admiral and military general of the Joseon dynasty, which was 1392 to 1897. He's very famous for his navy war tactics against the Japanese in the Imjin War, 1592-1597, as well as his military conduct and leadership, which later served as the military exemplar. Yi Sun Shin was a great leader, and ever since he was a little boy, he had perseverance and optimism. Korea is the country it is today, all thanks to him. He's considered one of the greatest admirals and military generals in history except he's unfortunately overlooked in the West. Despite having no prior military training, he never lost a battle or a single ship. He's also Philip's hero. Yi Sun Shin was born April 28, 1545 in Hansong, Joseon, Korea, to a family of good means, as his family was a part of the Doksu Yi clan and had connections with politics. His grandfather was a retired politician which is where the connection came from. Yi Sun Shin was known as a smart young boy who was brilliant at war games and especially talented with the bow and arrow. By the time he was a teenager, he was crafting his own weapons all by himself. He began his military career in the Northern Frontier Army after passing the Mukwa, or military exam, in 1576, although he had failed it one time before. He became an officer at the age of 34, which is super old and uncommon. He was discharged twice and demoted to the bottom of the enlisted rank, all because of those who were jealous of him. The Gobuk-son, or westernly described as the turtle ship, was a ship used by Korea to fight back at the Japanese who were aggressively trying to invade. It was first used in the second campaign, Battle of Sachon, in 1592 by Yi Sun Shin. Yi Sun Shin was responsible for designing the improved version of the ship. The predecessor turtle ships were designed by Zhang Bogo. The Gobuk San had a revolutionary design, especially for its time. Many ships during this time had an open, vulnerable deck, but the Gobuk San had a metal covering which encased the top deck, providing protection from incoming threats. This shell gave it the turtle-like appearance hence its name. It was considered the first armored ship in history. Other defenses of the turtle ship, it had a length of 100 to 120 feet and could house 100 to 150 soldiers. It also had a shell armor covering which was spiked to prevent invaders from coming on board. Furthermore, a 5-ton soaking wet mat on top of it made it able to withstand fire attacks. Cannons, or chongtong, the ship had a variety of different cannons in its arsenal, such as the Chonja Chongtong, or the Sky or Heaven Cannon, which was the largest of these cannons. A reason this was a prominent feature of the turtle ship is because the Japanese did not use cannons on their ship. Another factor was the dragon's head on the bow, or the front part of the ship, which was an intimidation factor. However, Admiral Yi found other ways to use this feature, such as using it as an extra cannon, a smoke screen, or incendiaries. Yi Sun Shin faced many political challenges, such as during the Imjin Wars, Yi, a young officer, was starting to become well known for his strategic mastery and leadership. However, corruption in the Joseon army led to superior officers feeling threatened by the accomplished newcomer. This led to a sabotage on Yi's career in 1587 when General Yi Il organized conspirators to falsely accuse Yi Sun Shin of desertion during battle, which had him arrested, demoted, and tortured. When Yi Sun Shin was released, he immediately re-enlisted as a foot soldier and worked his way up to the military rank again, but his refusal to compromise to corruption, such as nepotism, made him few friends and his value as a military leader became his main grace in the Joseon army. Furthermore, in 1593, Yi Sunshin was appointed the supreme naval commander of all three provinces, which gave him complete command over the entire Korean fleet. However, during this time, Yoshira, a Japanese double agent, had made his way into the Joseon court. He gave false intelligence to Joseon command, which almost led Yi Sunshin to lead his fleet into dangerous waters, where casualties would have been prominent. Yi Sunshin thankfully figured out this plan and refused to go ahead with the attack. However, this refusal, along with his poor reputation amongst other military commanders, 
led him to be arrested, tortured, and demoted again. However, this time he had gained the support of allies who helped him to get his sentence commuted, as well as work his way back up to military command a second time. So now that uh. So now that uh, Yi was in the position of commander of the fleet, this gave Japan a huge opportunity in that they were scared of uh, Admiral Yi. You know, they had all these naval campaigns, all these naval battles, you know, but Japan just couldn't win. I mean, they would always lose against uh, Admiral Yi and they just accepted that and they just stopped all naval battles against Korea. But now that they found out that Yi wasn't in the position... Uh, of commander of the fleet, Japan was like, hey, you know, this is our chance, you know, we're going to go strike Korea and, you know, conquer this country for ourselves. So, I mean, they did that. And uh, the new commander of the fleet named General Wang Gyun, he um, just totally sucked at his job. I mean, there's no better word to explain how he did. And um, it, it can be proven in the fact that Japan nearly wiped out the whole Korean fleet and they just left literally 13 ships. And General Wang Gyun was um, <laughs> fired for his um, actions, and uh, Yi came back with the help of his allies. And but um, yeah, he he came back, but he only had thirteen fleets to command, and um, Japan was ready to um, you know, do another a naval battle and a uh, conquer in you know, Korea. But you know, Yi wasn't gonna let that happen, and uh, the emperor was you know was very doubtful. But you know, he put Yi back in charge and said, "Hey, you know, get this done." And you know, Yi being the great man he is, he said, "I'm gonna get this done." So. So this uh ba so this uh battle when Yi came back um was the greatest battle for Yi in that this was his uh most victorious battle um this was called the Battle of Myeongyang um it's uh one of, it's actually regarded as one of the top five greatest naval battles in history and that's that's huge in that um if you're looking back in history you know there are there are a lot of um you know big countries. You know, especially in, you know, Europe where there are a lot of big naval battles, but this was one regarded as one of the top five, so that means a lot. And um the tactics Admiral Yi used were very uncommon at the time, but very uh strategic and very um ahead of the time. And this was uh and this tactic is actually used still today in uh naval strategy classes um throughout the world. So, you know, we're gonna you know, dive right into this battle, but clearly the ultra stacked against him, you know, there were thirteen ships against what 300 so i mean he was <laughs> i mean you could probably say that you know i would like to say that he was you know not even in contention with japan and might as well just uh lost but he you know being the great leader he is you know he he uh held his standards high he was optimistic you know he said he was going to get it done and i mean you know he went he, he knew his enemy and you know he he won every battle and you know he his men didn't die you know there were some casualties but very insignificant the fact that he beat all the battles against japan so you know um as you know the men knew who were with him you know 13 against 300 you know morals going to be all obviously low you know the men are just going to be hey you know we're just going to be prepared to go you know die you know this is this is, you know, we have no chance, basically. But um, <laughs> Admiral Yi, as I said, disregarded all of this. And, um, you know, being a true leader, it's you, you don't have to boost morale. And that's what, exactly what he did. And he said, hey, you know, if I die right here today, you know, so be it. But guess what? I'm going to give this all I've got, you know. I'm going I'm to show them what Korea is made of, you know. And that's that's how he showed true leadership. But um, one of his strategies, and probably one of the greatest one, was that the Myeongyang Strait, and um, this is actually called the Strait Where Stones Cry, and it's because the uh, currents are so strong that the stones at the bottom of the ocean or of the strait, it literally, you can hear it roll, and that still uh, holds true today. And if you go there, you could probably hear, hear that because that's what they say. But this strait was a choke point in that this was it, it had a very um, narrow entrance, but and so once you got in there, you getting out would be very hard because you'd have to, you know, form a line and, you know, only one ship would be able to uh, go out. But uh, other than that, you know, it was very strong currents, you know, mount, um, there are mountains um, uh, around the strait uh, causing a shadow. So, you know, light, you know, wasn't able to really penetrate. So unless you knew the environment really well, you would be at a very, uh, very great disadvantage. And that was Japan's um, position. And um, not just, you know, not to mention just the uh, st uh, strong currents, but there were, you know, some devastating whirlpools. And 
if you know anything, whirlpools will um cause a ship to you know go down immediately. And these whirlpools, yes, definitely gave um Admiral Yi and his fleet a great advantage. But uh, speaking of advantages, Admiral uh, Yi's ships had cannons, archers, and these were just very um uh what do you call it? Very beneficial in that Japan didn't have cannons or archers. Japan's main um, offensive strategy was ramming each other. So this was basically a, a considered what you call a close water combat. So ships would ram, you know, on the enemy ship and they'd go overboard. But like I said, you know, Admiral Yi had these turtle ships and these turtle ships had these spikes on them. So going overboard wouldn't do anything. And plus ramming, yeah, you could do that. But if you have cannons and archers, that's long range uh, weapons. So if you can do that, <laughs> you can't really come near a ship that has, um, you know, long range capability. So that was Japan's greatest disadvantage. While on Yi's side, that was his greatest advantage. So, so continuing on to Yi's greatest battle or the battle of Myeongyang Strait. Um, as I said, uh, the ratio was a 25 to one. So 30, 330 ships, uh, Japanese ships against 13 Korean ships. And, as I mentioned, Yi had these long-range weapons to his advantage, and using this, he bombarded and he critically damaged the uh, the uh, Japanese ships on the front line. And um, if you if you uh, look at um, how naval battles work, if your ship is um, hurt and going down, you have to jump overboard, or the whole ship is going to collapse, and you, you're going to end up in the water anyway. So a lot of these men, you know, once <laughs> Yi just totally destroyed their ship, they went overboard, but. Like I said, the currents were super strong and there were whirlpools. And these whirlpools just absolutely, you know, killed these guys. So that was out of the way. And um, speaking of currents, the currents actually changed south. So the current before this was actually going north. And that means um, it was going toward uh, shore. So it was going towards um, Yi's uh, fleet. But the current changed to south, which means it was going backwards. And I said the Myeongyang Strait to go in there, it's very, it's very narrow. But um, so when the current changed south, the Japanese fleet that were on the front lines that were all critically damaged and had just had debris, you know, laying around in the ocean, went back in it, and it caused this domino effect where these ships would be ramming um the ships behind it and basically using their advantage of ramming against themselves. So they were ramming each other, and that caused ships to break down and men to go overboard, and so they were losing men and ships. So yeah, I mean, this three hundred thirty was just dwindling down at a super fast rate. And, uh, yeah, Japan lost half their men and a very good portion of the ships. I like to say half of it, too. But uh, Yi lost none of his ships. Literally none. And only had 10 casualties. So, looking at that, Yi just was totally just... He knew... He, he was very intellectual and very just smart with how this battle was going to work. And Japan just played themselves, you know? This is basically a story of brute strength versus, you know, strategy. You know, like, yeah, you could have 330 ships, you know, just be just, you know, totally just have all the, um, what do you call it, the manpower. But if you don't know your environment or the strategy and just have no strategy, just go in thinking that because you have enough, um, you know, equipment or just, just manpower, it's, you're going to face a, a huge downfall. And Admiral Yi, you know, this, they, this was home core advantage too, you know, Japan's coming into Korean waters. So at this point, you know, Japan kind of played themselves and, Yi just being in that back in that position and just knowing how his um ships were going to work and how this was all going to play out, he he definitely had this one in the bag. After the successful battle of Nongyang, Admiral Yi and his fleet chased after a retreating Japanese force on the 16th of December 1598, which is known as the Battle of Noreng. Admiral Yi was struck by a stray bullet in his shoulder and died to the wound. Knowing he would die, he gave his armor to his nephew Yi Wan to take charge of the fleet and not let the Japanese know he was dead. He did this because he didn't want the Japanese to have any hope from his death and he wanted to keep the, his sailor morale high. He said, the war is at its height. Wear my armor and beat my war drums. Do not announce my death. The pursuit for the Japanese was the last battle fought 
which allow Korea to be safe from being conquered by the Japan Empire. Both North Korea and South Korea also heavily divided. Honor Admiral Yi for his bravery and loyalty to the Joseon dynasty. Admiral Yi holds the third highest rank in the South Korean military and North Korea named a military award after Admiral Yi. Many streets in Korea were named after the Honorable Admiral. The 101 coin also featured Admiral Yi in the front throughout many versions of the coins. There's a lot of statues were raised up in honor for Admiral Yi, notably one in Seoul, Korea and in Busan. A Korea KDX-2 naval destroyer class were named after Admiral Yi. In 2014, the movie The Admiral Roaring Currents was based on the Battle of Nongyang and Admiral Yi story. The 10 The 10 Korean words we found interesting are Gobokson, which is the ship designed by Yi Shenshin, famous for its shell like metal covering. The next word is Deju Son Kuk, which is the Joseon dynasty. The next word is Mu Gua, which is military examination. The next word is Samdo Sugun Tongjesa which is Naval Commander of the Three Province and is Admiral Yi's title. The next word is Nongyang Daechup, which is the Battle of Nongyang. The next word is Chongtong, which means gunnery slash cannon for the Joshan era. The next word is Hua War Hua Sa, which means bows and arrow. The next word is Yong Mori, which means dragon head. The next word is Sukak, which means incendiary. The next word is Subai which stands for spike.